Cogsworth, it's time to meet your older brother. This is Pipsqueak. Both robots took about the same amount of time to build, but unlike Cogsworth, there was only two days of frustration with this one right at the end when it came to fine-tune things. But really the biggest difference beyond the size is the build quality. Though, like any real engineering project, it's still secretly held together with zip ties, duct tape, and a prayer to the engineering gods, but we'll get to that later. When we left off last week, this is all of Pipsqueak that had been built. The main drive gears had been cut, as had the supports, bearing assembly, and antenna mount. This week we need to remake the bearing track, build a base for everything to be mounted on, mount all the electronics, and get things moving. To get things started, I set up the mill to cut a new bearing track. As many of you pointed out last week, there was burning issues as I was cutting things. That's because I was using whatever bits we had laying around, and most were dull or rusty. By this week I had had a chance to order some shiny new bits, and they cut way better. While that was cutting, I turned my attention to the rest of the pieces, as this is going to take all night to mill. I mentioned that we needed to shave a few inches off the armature, so that was the first on the docket and was a very quick job. While working on the armature, I took a moment to add two bolt holes so that the large gear could be securely mounted. I made a point later to purposely elongate these holes to add a little bit of wiggle room so that the gear could be gently shifted into its optimal position to mesh with the drive gear since we had issues with that down the line. Next, I went to work making a counterweight for the antenna. We had a bunch of scrap steel L channels, so after figuring out approximately how much I'd need, I started cutting them into short sections. To test the amount of weight, initially I would just stack them all together around the armature and zip tie them in place to test how well things balanced. Once I'd found an optimal number of pieces, I made two even piles and epoxied them into two stacks. To let them easily sit flat on the armature, I also included a small piece of MDF as a base plate. Later, we also added a strip of duct tape underneath to add more friction between the plates and the aluminum, but we'll come back to why later. By the time that was done, the bearing track was finishing up. Since I didn't have bits that could cut all the way through this thick piece of wood, I made a point of machining a slightly deeper groove to show where the inner diameter was supposed to be. I drilled a quick hole, then took it over to the scroll saw to remove the intersection. A bit of filing and sanding to remove any burrs, and the bearing track was done. With the mill free, I mounted a piece of aluminum and started cutting out mounting plates for both of the stepper motors. You can tell that this is my first real milling project, because I snapped four bits just cutting these, even with an incredibly slow feed rate. So that's going to take some more practice to get good at. And probably more bits. Now I need some legs and a base plate. For the base plate, I just used a piece of sturdy plywood, and for the legs, I cut more steel L-channel and drilled holes for screws to attach to the base plate and bearing track. Before I can mount everything, I'm going to need a weight that will hang at the bottom of the vertical supports to prevent things from being top-heavy. I found a piece of steel plate, and after finding its balance point and carefully marking out the dimensions I need for it to fit between the vertical supports, I started cutting it with a hacksaw. After quickly realizing that was stupid and exhausting, I switched to the bandsaw, which had a much easier time of it. Since I was trying to make this build look as good as possible before assembling things, I took some time to give everything a nice paint job with some black spray paint. This is entirely optional, but I think it makes things look a lot nicer and should help prevent the steel parts from rusting. The last step is to add 10 bolt holes to the vertical supports. Working our way from bottom to top, the first pair is for bolts that will hold the lower weight from falling off. The next set is to rest on the bearing assembly so that the vertical supports don't slide, and the next is to set where the azimuth gear sits. I actually ended up re-drilling these four because once everything was built, we were having some unexpected collision issues due to a last minute design change. So they were re-drilled lower on the vertical supports to raise the upper assembly and stop the collisions. This made things a bit more wobbly, but not terribly so. The last four holes were for mounting the now finished stepper motor mount, which was cleaned up with a file and drill press off camera. Oh, and one final change is that we subbed out the steel tubing that we were using as spacers to hold the armature in the center for some Teflon tubing instead. This decreased the friction a lot and really helped things move better, especially once everything was bolted together. Okay, with that done, we can finally put things together for a test fit. Before adding the legs and bearing track, four holes were drilled in the base plate for four large bolts that'll act as adjustable feet to make sure things are level when we put this on a new surface. With that done, the legs were mounted, followed by the bearing track. Then the vertical supports are slid into place, the weight is added to the bottom, as is the mounting bracket and bolts that hold them in place. Before the armature was mounted, we mounted the stepper motor to fit in place first. To mount the lower stepper, I first had to cut two pieces of wood which will hold the stepper and gear at the right height. These each had two holes drilled in them that were oversized so that a screw could fit inside and connect these to the bearing track. The stepper motor was connected to its mounting plate, and the drive gear was added, and then these wooden blocks could be positioned on the bearing track and the stepper mounted. Before we can test this, we're going to need to give Pipsqueak a brain. We're using the same Ramps 1.4 board that we removed from Cogsworth, since he won't be needing it anymore. To connect the steppers to the board, I made two cables of four wires each that were nice and long. Paul correctly guessed that we'd probably end up taking this whole thing apart several times, so on his suggestion, rather than soldering the wires directly to the stepper, they were instead soldered onto a detachable connector. We're using 8-wire high-torque steppers, which means that there's two ways you can wire them. 
If you want more speed, you wire their internal coils in parallel, but if you want more torque, you need to wire them in series. As we were testing this, it became apparent that even with all the work to try and make things move as smoothly as possible and be as balanced as possible, the amount of weight we were attempting to move with these little steppers was still almost more than they could handle. So after turning the current all the way up on the Palulu driver boards and wiring these in series, the stepper and driver motors were getting very hot. We remedied this by mounting some fans to the steppers and making a box with two fans for the ramps board. To run all of the fans, they were wired together in parallel and connected to the main power input from the power supply used to run everything. You may have noticed early on in the build that the horizontal gear and bearing assembly had these holes in the middle. When it came time to wire everything up, the cables from the upper stepper, fan, and eventually the coax that feeds the antenna could be fed through here so that the wires won't get tangled in the gears as they move. And this happens to be extra convenient because my hack RF can be mounted just above the lower weight, keeping the lengths of coax nice and short. Then all we need to do is run a long USB wire which aren't as sensitive to data loss. When we built Cogsworth, you may remember that we had to add a key to the shaft that controlled the rotation to prevent it from slipping. Well, we had the same issue with the little drive gears, and as soon as the epoxy cracked the first time, both steppers had to be removed so that they could be keyed. But after that, we didn't have any slippage problems with these gears. I've left out a lot of the footage, but throughout all of these changes, we were constantly firing up the system to give it a try and see what was working and what was going wrong. During one of the later tests, we were adjusting the weight so that the arm was balanced well enough that the steppers could easily move it. After one such adjustment, we suffered a rapid, unplanned disassembly. At this point in the day, many of the other members of the hackerspace had arrived and quickly jumped into action to help out. It was at this point that we'd added that strip of duct tape to the bottom of the weights and to the part of the armature that the weight sits on to add more friction and prevent another RUD. But while we were tweaking everything, we noticed that the bearing track wasn't sitting quite level and was kind of wobbly. So four more braces were added by cutting some wood and removing one leg at a time to drill more holes in the steel. Once these were added, things were a lot more stable and level. Throughout this whole process, I talked a lot about what I call cascade fixing. Every time you fix one thing, three others break that now need fixing. And that was the case throughout this whole build. Some such fixes including having to reposition the upper stepper mounting plate to make the gears mesh better, or raising the whole upper assembly that we talked about earlier. By the end of Tuesday night, everything was finally working and the whole system was moving smoothly, so all the cables could be zip-tied into what will hopefully be their final resting place. And that's pretty much all there is to Pipsqueak. I think that this is hands down one of the best builds I've ever made to date. Now, I'm no mech eng, but I think this whole build came out really well in the end. I mentioned last week that I'll be posting all of the SVGs for making every piece of this build, and I will, but I need some more time to make adjustments to them and take into account all of the changes that were made by the end, so check the description and I should have links to the files soon. I'll also be posting a document of measurements for all of the vertical supports, base plates, and other bits and bobs. Now I know all of you want to see this build put to use, but that's going to have to wait. I expect Pipsqueak to be a core part of many videos over the next few months as we pull data from many satellites, do a bunch of radio astronomy, and so much more. But next week I'll be taking a short break because I just put in my first big order of supplies for the new Biolab. So next week we'll be starting on a series showing how that lab is built from the ground up, starting with the clean room that will house the lab. As those supplies arrive, I'll be going through every piece to show what it takes to build a genetic engineering lab on a budget, and of course, once it's built and everything has arrived, it'll be a source of so much content over the next many months and years. If you enjoy these videos and want to see more, then as always, be sure to subscribe and most importantly, ring that bell to see when I post new videos. These videos are supported by my amazing patrons, so if you'd like to support the continued production of videos and open source science, then consider kicking a buck or two my way. Your support at whatever level you're comfortable with is greatly appreciated. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.